morning, Brock. Great to see you as always. Was Sean Payton um, <laughs> kind of getting down dirty <laughs> and defending Russell Wilson? It's easy to see the comments and think he crushed Hackett. What I read into it is, no, 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 no. I am selling to this locker room. Don't blame Russell. This was a that that was my interpretation of his comments. Your thoughts? No, I think that's totally fair. You know, he used a term this off season, Colin, that I really loved, and I think you'll like it too. And, and maybe you've already talked about it, but Sean Payton got that job and really asked Russell Wilson and the entire team to start being anonymous donors, stop being these social media influencers, and start to be an anonymous donor. Buy in. And what you have seen really over the last six months, Colin, in the social media world, in the public realm, is a lot less of Russell and Sierra putting themselves out there trying to be the show and realizing through a big, thick slice of humble pie last year that it didn't work. That me being the show, me being the coach, me running things with a, with a Nathaniel Hackett absolutely broke his reputation. And now he's coming back to, well, a whole lot more of the control and the umbrella that Pete Carroll had. Uh, over Russell Wilson, certainly at the start of Russell's career in Seattle. What is a reasonable, in your eyes, having played in this year for six leagues, you were a quarterback, you dealt, you played with Peyton Manning. You know the profile, the pressure. What is realistic in year one in the AFC for Denver? Well, Sean Payton said in that article that they're a playoff team. So can they get to, to 10 wins? Is that reasonable? You know, and, and what was supposed to be a rebuild in Seattle last year they get themselves to the playoffs with what nine wins, nine, ten wins. I think, I think nine feels like a reasonable number to me in that division. But you just were talking about Justin Herbert and being an overcomer. I think the word in, that's synonymous with that to me, Colin, around Peyton, uh, my older brother around Tom Brady. Yes, you're an overcomer, and you elevate everybody in the room. Right? We're really saying the same things. So you're overcome all the other stuff. But I love elevate. Can you elevate everybody to the next level? When that guy, Russell Wilson, was in Seattle, it didn't matter who came off the street at tight end. <laughs> it didn't matter who he was throwing to, whether they were undrafted free agents like Curse and Doug Baldwin, right? He elevated everybody around him. And I don't think Sean Payton has got a sense over these last three months of being on the field with Russell. There's still enough there. But it's the Russell that's going to move. It's the Russell that's going to create. It's the Russell that's going to be in play action. It's the Russell that's going to move around and extend plays. And we're going to play and bring in a massive offensive tackle in McGlinchey. I'm going to bring a hammer in P. Ryan. We're going to run the ball. We're going to play action. We're going to get back to your strengths. Everything that Russell thought he could do and wanted to flush from his reputation in Seattle and say, no, 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 no. I'm Drew Brees. I'm a pocket guy. I think you're actually going to get exactly back to the Russell Wilson that was in Seattle. And Sean Payton knows that that one in this league can still win and elevate and maybe even get you to the playoffs with nine or ten wins. So you know Pete Carroll well in the Seattle culture. Last year, I was wrong. I thought he was being stubborn. I thought he had to figure out a way to work with Russell Wilson. But they looked like geniuses. They got draft capital. Geno had a great year. Geno, yeah, I was happy for him. I mean, let's be honest. I liked it. I mean, it was a story I've never seen before. He was a bust. Redemption. So it, it, it's a great American sports story. And Gino appears to have grown up. He's a good kid. But now I'm saying, can he do it again? Am I being too cynical? It's still a very young team on offense. Offensive line's young. No. Running backs are kids. Receivers are young. Take me where you think Seattle is with Gino, the Gino thing year two. Well, I think at number five and 20, Colin, and I know you love team building like Salk and I love it on our radio show in Seattle. You love as much how they build this team, the creativity of it, the vision of it, right? You have spent so much of your career in a great way and wrote a great book about how you build these teams and the way that people do it differently. I think at number five and 20, they kind of answer your question. What did they do at number five? They went out and got an elite corner, a guy they think with Tariq Woolen can be a shutdown man-to-man and play the kind of defense from the back forward that Pete loves. But what did they do at number 20? Did they go and get a D lineman? Maybe their biggest need at 20, right? Did they did they add to the run game? Did they, did they get off it? No. What did they do at 20? They got the number one receiver in this draft. The first receiver taken in Jackson Smith and Jigba. And I think that was Pete. I think that was John Schneider saying, Geno's good. That's what you're saying, Colin. Geno's good. Gino be great. 
how do you go, right? Jim Collins wrote that book two decades ago, good to great in business. How do I go from good to great? And I think they told you, get me a third down mercenary. Get me a guy in that slot that frees up DK and Tyler and these tight ends and Ken Walker behind him. That's the step that he's going to be looking to take. I think he can be good. I don't think last year was a fluke. Those numbers by the end of the year were real and you had to swallow them. <laughs> and I know you did like this is out of nowhere, but going from good to great is going to take Jackson Smith and Jigba being a pretty elite dude like he was at Ohio State. So I, I, I said <clears throat> taking a $35 million pay cut for Aaron Rodgers is not a shave. It's like a brand pivot. Uh, it's a realignment of priorities. And I, I do think you would move your family a couple years ago. I, I think it's starting over is, is some people need it. It's good for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I know and when I've moved from local to syndicated, every time I try, okay, I want to get better at that. I'm not going to do that. I got to do this better. It's, it's like a, the chalkboard. It's all fresh. It's wiped clean. Um, I don't know. I, I've, I criticized Aaron for years. I thought he was disengaged, a little aloof. I don't know. It, it feels like he, he looked at Green Bay and went, I wasn't good at this, this, and this. I'm going to get better at that stuff. That, that's, my, mm -hmm. that's how it lands for me. How about you? Yeah, my father-in-law has got a bunch of sayings, Colin, that have stuck in my head for 20-some years. I've been married to his daughter, Molly. And one of them, and this was early on, and I'm the son of a coach, right? My dad was an esteemed football high school coach in Washington, teacher and coach, and that's what I had known. Uh, my father-in-law, Larry, spent his life in business, and he would say people enjoy doing business or people uh, do business with people they enjoy. And Aaron, after all those years in Green Bay and drafting Jordan Love, it was very clear he was tired of doing business in Green Bay. Yeah. And now he's found an environment with young people, a young coach, New York City, as you said, a chance to totally reinvent his brand. And I think he's just enjoying doing business with people he enjoys being around right now. And it just got to a point in Green Bay that was not the case. And so much so that in business, he's doing something we've never seen <laughs> and taking a $35 million pay cut because he and so enjoys and is energized by this new environment. Finally, uh, we grew up Pac-12 fans. You played for Washington, obviously. Uh, that conference is going through some turbulence now. But I want to focus mm -hmm. in on Deion Sanders in Colorado. Uh, Dion has uh, not wavered. This is how I'm doing it. We're starting over. We don't have enough good players. Now there's a story they could go to the Big 12. You live not far from Boulder, maybe a different world, yeah. even though it's not that far geographically. Um, how, is it, how is it playing in Colorado? Dion, I, when he first got the job, I thought, this is a weird fit. And then I thought over the weekend, I thought, you know, nobody talks about Colorado. He's going to get recruiting attention. How is it all landing, the cleaning the program, Big 12 talk there? Well, the CU alums are totally energized, to your point. I mean, they have been basement. They've not been Northwestern or Vanderbilt or the very, very bottom. But as far as, as you said, on the national radar, what, one winning season in the last, like, 15 years, Colin? One meaningful bowl game in the last decade? So he has just brought his juice and you mentioned Lincoln Riley earlier, and I'm very curious. You could talk to your sources about this. Do you think Lincoln and Dion both knew? Do you think Lincoln, to leave Norman to go to USC, knew what was inevitable with SC going to the Big Ten? Yeah. You think Dion, a, a Texas guy, right, and, and all of his background there, do you think he knew that, yep, you know what, we're going to actually move back to that conference we were once in, and, and all of those roots that I have in those markets down in Texas, I'm going to be able to watch them bloom a little bit. I, I tend to think that maybe they knew a little bit ahead of the rest of us. So, yeah, he's got a huge project ahead of him. Do I think they're going to go to a bowl game this year? No, because I think the line of scrimmage is still pretty darn important in football, and they've got a long ways to go. <laughs> but do I know that our company is excited to watch the Dion show in prime time? Yeah. Do I know that Gus and Joel are going to be – at TCU and at Nebraska the first two weeks to see what this show is all about. He's bright lights. He's prime time. He's big time. And we're all going to get a chance to watch it. Brock, as always, you do such great work. Brock Heward, Fox Sports. So, so glad you're part of the family, my man. Good seeing you. Hey, Colin, let me just give one last shout out. Okay. Uh, Paul Seawalt. I don't know if you know that name, but he's going to be a trade ship for the Mariners. Loves you. Loves this show just as so many do <laughs> as well. 
So keep an eye on Pete Paul Seawall the next week, all right? All right. I've got my original Mariners hat from the debut in April of 1977. I can name the lineup, but J-Mac won't let me. Brock Heward. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.